Um, I'm really, really excited to start us off by sharing information with you about Imagined Contact, um, and that will be in the context of my doctoral thesis that I just completed in the summer. Um, so just so that you understand the specific context of the background that I'm about to go into, um, just to say that I specifically focused on whether Imagined Contact could be used to improve children's views and responses towards their autistic peers um, and just to note there that I will be using um, identity first um, language throughout this part of the presentation um, so I'm looking at the um, application of imagined contact in that context but I will briefly share more information and research about imagined contact and disability more generally as we go through um, and a big thank you to Sean and my other supervisor Sarah Wright um, for supervising my thesis <laughs> Um, next slide, please. So despite a growing need to promote inclusion and acceptance of all disabled young people, but and particularly autistic young people, uh, these individuals often face harmful responses from their peers, um, and that can include uh, negative attitudes, victimization and bullying, uh, which can then lead to reduced confidence, social withdrawal and the need to mask their true self, um, which can then hugely increase the likelihood of them experiencing mental health difficulties um, and that's just one uh, consequence really just one example um, but it has been argued that there continues to be this deficit-based perspective about autism implying that um, perhaps it's something that needs to be fixed or changed in some way rather than um, how we view it uh, acknowledging autism as part of natural neurodiversity so within my thesis project my main argument was that rather than us intervening about these peer responses at an individual level um, such as you know changing how an autistic child acts or behaves in social situations which then risks reinforcing that deficit-based perspective um, you know we need to shift towards a more systemic positive approach that directly targets these barriers in the environment to promote inclusion i.e how children respond and view respond to and view their autistic peers uh, next slide please so one way that we can intervene more systemically is through an intervention called imagined contact. Um, this is an extension of direct contact and it's based on all ports intergroup contact theory and it's defined as the mental simulation of a social interaction with a member or members of an out group. Imagining positive contact can help individuals to imagine the perspective <laughs> of others and help to create and practice scripts. Um, Imagine Contact really lends itself to younger children as it's very simple um, and helped by strong imaginations. Um, it can also help um, individuals to access their emotions or feelings that they might actually experience in actual direct contact and can give a robust cognitive basis for future behaviour through the creations of behavioural scripts. There has been a recent increase in studies exploring the use of imagined contact and it has shown success um, in promoting children's attitudes and behavioural intentions uh, but this research is mainly towards physically disabled peers um, and I'll share an example of that study in the next slide. There is only one study at the moment looking at the use of imagined contact in improving attitudes and intentions towards a child with Asperger's syndrome but that diagnostic term is outdated so it's really difficult to generalise those findings um, to those individuals who are diagnosed with or self-identifies autistic. Um, my systematic literature review that I did for my thesis also highlighted that there's a lot of heterogeneity in previous research. Um, it makes it really hard for practitioners to actually understand, well, what can imagined contact look like in practice and what is the evidence base actually for? So I found that there was a real need to replicate previous studies, so successful elements of those, to understand what are the actual evidence-based components of an imagined contact intervention? Uh, next slide, please. Um, before we go into my research questions, I just wanted us to take a step back um, to think about why contact actually matters. Um, so according to a report from the charity Scope published in 2018, just 17% of those who don't know a disabled person think there is a lot of prejudice against disabled people. Um, and this compares to 37% of respondents who have a disabled friend they know fairly well. And 
Similarly, having any kind of contact with a disabled person makes you significantly less likely to think of disabled people as getting in the way when compared to someone who says they have no contact with disabled people. So hopefully that um, really accentuates why contact really matters. Um, next slide, please. So thinking back to over a decade ago, um, around 2011 time, researchers began to think about how we can increase positive contact between children and their disabled peers, but without the need for those direct interactions, because there are situations where this is not possible, such as in communities or school settings where there's a low population of disabled children. So in 2011, Cameron and colleagues published their study looking at the use of imagined contact. Um, so here they asked children between five to nine years old to imagine playing with a disabled child um, and that was facilitated using 2D pictures of a park and photographs of a typically developing child and a child with an intellectual or physical disability and following that intervention they found that attitudes towards the outgroup i.e disabled children um, outgroup is a term that we're not fond of but it's just being used here for the purposes of explaining these findings um, were more positive than those attitudes of the children in the control group. So they didn't imagine contact with a disabled peer. Um, and they also found that for five to six year olds, um, intended friendship behaviour also increased. And they um, hypothesised that perhaps younger children might have had less prior experience with disabled peers. So their intentions might be less entrenched, perhaps, than older children. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's really important to bear in mind that there is still debate around how best can we engage children and imagine contact and there's lots of different methods. So in one study, for example, by Vizali and colleagues um, in 2012, they asked children to imagine contact through writing about an interaction with a child who had recently immigrated. Um, others have used 2D pictures, as I've said before, or even just asking um, children to imagine a conversation or using picture books. Uh, but we believe that engaging children and imagine contact via say pretend play with 3D figures i.e toys um, can provide a more tangible hands-on experience um, and in fact a recent review um, by Gleason and White in 2003 um, I feel supports this argument because they say that you know mentally transforming objects and playing different roles in fictional worlds can really enable children to consider experiences beyond their own perception. Next slide please. So coming back to my research, um, research question one uh, was thinking about does participating in an imagined contact intervention with 3D toy figures improve children's responses towards their autistic peers? Um, and I hypothesise that for those who imagined contact with an autistic peer would have um, increased attitudes, intentions and self-reported behaviour compared to a control group. And I'll go into how I measured those shortly. Um, I also wanted to explore what variables um, mediate that relationship between taking part in the imagined contact intervention and then responses towards autistic peers. Um, and I hypothesise that cognitive empathy, um, which is the ability to adopt the perspective of another, effective empathy, which is the ability to vicariously experience another person's emotion, inclusion of the other in the self, um, which is someone's perception of their degree of closeness to another person. And um, so I hypothesise that there would be increased um, and also decreased in anxiety would be significant mediators of this relationship. Next slide, please. So how did I do this? Um, I was fortunate to have 61 wonderful participants um, take part in my study. They were all primary age uh, between six to nine years old uh, within the Berkshire region in England. Um, and they were randomly assigned to either take part in the experimental group, which was imagining contact with an autistic peer or the control group. So imagining contact with a neurotypical peer. Um, just to say that four children across the um, sample identified as autistic um, and four children knew at least one autistic person. Next slide, please. 
So with the procedure, all participants were given an age appropriate definition of autism, which I got from the National Autistic Society, and they were then presented with this tree house play scene, uh, which hopefully you can see on the screen. And they were asked to choose from one of four 3D figures um, with whom they most identified with. Um, so here in the middle of the screen is an example. And once they had chosen that figure, they were then presented with either an autistic or neurotypical doll, uh, depending on their assigned group. Um, so here on the end of the screen with the dog uh, um, is Hayden, uh, one of the autistic dolls, um, and they were given some information about him um, or Hattie um, if they were a female taking part in the study. And then they were administered the pre-intervention dependent measures, um, which I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, but just to say that after these measures had taken place um, for the intervention itself, I asked all children to imagine they go to the park together uh, and they see this tree house. Show me how you would have a really good time together. Um, and I asked them to do that for three minutes. And then I administered the post intervention measures. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for the measures, I'm just going to skim over these, but please do ask if you have any questions. Um, so firstly, I assessed three components of attitudes towards autistic peers on a five point like it scale. Um, and these three components of attitudes um, are um, beliefs, so cognitive attitudes, affective attitudes, which are their feelings, and then their behavioural attitudes, um, so their intentions towards autistic peers. Next slide, please. Um, then I also administered a self-reported um, behaviour measure. Um, so pre-intervention, I asked children to allocate five coins between a neurotypical and autistic hypothetical peer. Um, and then after the intervention to measure their self-reported behaviour, I asked whether they would choose to wear a sticker, um, which as you can see says, um, I care for and support autistic children. Next slide, please. And then finally, I also administered measures for the four mediating variables that I uh, mentioned earlier, pre and post intervention. Um, they were all measured on a five point like it scale, apart from inclusion of the other in the self. Um, that was measured using four pairs of overlapping circles, um, showing degree of closeness between um, the participant and an autistic peer, and they were asked to choose one. Um, as I said, I'm really sorry to skip over the measure so quickly, but feel free to ask more about, uh, about this later on. Um, next slide, please. We're on to the results now. Uh, so on the home straight. Um, so I'm going to share the results, but weave part of the discussion in so I can tie it together. Um, I haven't included a lot of numbers on this slide to make it clearer, um, but just to say that I accepted significance at the 0 0.05 level. So I did two way analysis of covariance tests to look at group differences uh, between um, the experimental and the control group, and I controlled for four covariates. So um, the age, the sex, whether participants identified as autistic and the number of autistic people um, they knew. Um, and this revealed that for all of the attitude scores, so beliefs, feelings and intentions, the post intervention mean scores were significantly more positive in the experimental compared to the control group. Um, and even more excitingly, there was no significant differences for the pre intervention scores. So that indicated that their attitudes were actually at similar levels before the intervention. Um, and we also saw um, a significant improvement in those mean scores from pre to post intervention in the experimental group, but not for the control group. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, however, next slide, please. Um, to test whether we found a difference in groups for the self-reported measure, the sticker, um, I did a logistic, a binomial logistic regression, again, controlling for those covariates, um, as well as the pre-intervention coin measure. The model wasn't significant. And as you can see, the choice to wear a sticker was um, really um, similar between groups. And when we reflected back, we wondered whether, you know, using stickers is really an accurate way to measure behaviour. Some children might have chosen to wear a sticker just because they saw a classmate have one. Um, so, it's just something to bear in mind. Uh, right, next slide, please. Um, so then I did some really exciting mediations. Um, 
And it is really important to say, though, that with the mediations, I only inputted the post intervention scores. So we do need to treat these findings with a bit of caution. Um, but I did do some t-tests and they did reveal a significant difference from pre to post intervention for all of the mediators um, in the experimental group. So firstly, um, the findings suggested that we have this significant serial process where being in the experimental group leads to more positive beliefs, so the cognitive attitudes, so hopefully you can see that arrow going up there, um, which then leads to positive feelings, which then in turn improves intentions um, towards autistic children. Um, and we found that this wasn't significant when feelings and beliefs were the other way around. So it's really exciting serial process here. Um, hopefully I haven't complicated it too much with all the arrows and numbers on the screen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with those four mediators, um, our analysis also revealed that um, increased cognitive empathy and increased inclusion of the other in the self um, significantly mediated that association between um, being in the experimental group and then positive intentions towards autistic peers. Um, so that was really good. But moving on to the next slide with anxiety, this was a really interesting finding. Um, anxiety actually increased as a result of the intervention rather than reduced, as I hypothesised, um, which then led to um, less positive intentions. Um, but actually, as you can see at the bottom, the total and direct effect, they were still positive, um, which indicates that taking part in the experimental group still continued to be associated with more favourable attitudes towards autistic peers. Um, so my tentative hypothesis here that is that increased cognitive empathy and inclusion of the other in the self might actually act as a buffer against the anxiety that children might experience when they're imagining contact with a disabled peer. Uh, but we definitely need more future research to explore this. Um, and just to say, we didn't have any significant effects for effective um, empathy. Um, and also we did run the analysis um, without the participants who identified as or knew someone autistic and the results didn't change. Um, Thank you. I think that's all from me. <laughs> Hopefully I haven't overwhelmed you uh, with all those stats. But as I said, always happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, and yeah. yeah. Yep, so just to finish then, I just wanted to show you this wonderful trainee clinical psychologist called Heidi. I've just put her username there. Um, she has created um, this visual of the research that I've done. So um, I won't leave it on the screen for too long, but I have got it on my own Twitter. Um, but if you look at Heidi Psychology on Twitter and also on Instagram, um, she has shared this visual and perhaps I can send it out at the end. Um, I think it's just a nice summary of what we did and what we found. I think Thank you so much for listening. Um, and I said, hope I haven't overwhelmed you. <laughs> hey, thank you, Sarah. That's really useful overview of the psychological impact, um, psychological drivers of the effects that we're seeing. So the effects that we're seeing are on um, children's intentions as a result of them taking part in this imagined play. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, Cool. Um, so as I promised, I'm going to talk you through how that relates to the more educational based theories um, that I've come across. I'm a bit of a, um, a vulture so a researcher because I'm actually a psychologist and then I've moved over to education. I'm just stealing ideas from psychology and education and, psych and sociology. So this is what I see as educational theory behind our uh, behind our resources before I let Claire review them for us. Um, so if we could have the next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about representation and the importance of representation in children's um, material culture. So by children's material culture, we're talking about the books that they read, the films that they see, um, the things that they play with um, out in the world and the things that they play with at home and at school, um, things that are material um, to them that often are shared between people. Um, hence material culture. Um, and we're going to look at the possibilities of engaging with that material culture, but with the particular focus on their toys, um, as Soraya did um, with the Lottie doll toys, to look at how that might, um, through representation, affect attitudes. 
Um, because if we can combine all these things, if we can combine uh, imagination and play and representation into the curriculum, then we've got a really good basis then for fostering positive attitudes towards uh, disability and towards disabled people. Can I have the next slide, please? So what about representation and inclusion? Um, we know that from Cameron, um, who Soraya talked about earlier, that positive representation in the form of books and other mediators, sorry, other media, media can, lead, like, can lend children higher self-esteem and a sense of belonging, as well as those more positive attitudes. And other educational researchers, for example, Kim and colleagues, um, have looked at how integrating that kind of diversity into the lit literacy curriculum can encourage a whole host of other so psychological benefits, socio-emotional skills, um, social awareness, empathy, um, and just being able to build those positive relationships that are the foundation of, of being in the classroom. And for, we're fortunate enough, um, speaking in 2023, to have some amazing representative books out there, um, Edie Eckhart, um, a, a wee girl, um, Cerebral Palsy, um, written by Rosie Jones, who herself has Cerebral Palsy, and then What Happened to You, about a boy with a limb difference, um, written by James Catchpole, who himself has a limb difference. And um, to our minds, these are really useful representative resources to have in schools. So we'll come back to that in a wee bit. Um, next slide, please. And the reason why we love those resources, um, those books in particular, is because the history of representation of disability in books isn't great. Um, if you think about maybe the books that you had around when you were a child, you might think of Heidi um, and Clara in Heidi. You might think of Katie and what Katie did. Um, you might think of Colin in The Secret Garden, all of whom were disabled in some way. And what you might remember, if you can cast your mind back, is that those stories had a tragedy narrative to them. So the character is often disabled within the book and something happens, some kind of miracle happens that brings them out of their disability. So they're magically cured and it kind of paints a picture of disability as something that is tragic and something that needs to be overcome and something that needs to be uh, recovered from. In order to be whole, you have to be non-disabled. Um, and Hayden and Prince, however, argue that we need to change this narrative. We need to change that tragedy narrative and we need to have disabled fictional characters that are empowering and that have those positive views of the world where it's okay to be disabled and it's positive to be disabled um, and I really could have done with some of these um, books like Edie Eckhart when I was growing up. Um, Jacqueline Wilson has recently rewritten Katie and I probably should say at this point we're not sponsored by any book publishers we're just going through and finding the ones that we really like and that we really enjoy reading um, and Katie in the Katie of Jacqueline Wilson is the same story as what Katie did without that tragedy narrative she stays disabled and that's okay can i have the next slide please unfortunately um even though those resources are out there um and increasingly so there's been a, a beginning of, in the market of these books recently disability representation when we audit it in in school classrooms across the world is remarkably low. So Favaza and colleagues started this work in 2017 and they were looking at infant classrooms um, in the US and they found that in those infant classrooms um, there were 32 um, that they looked at. Two of them had some representation of disability. So on the walls, in the curriculum materials, there was something going on about disability. Um, 22 classrooms had low representation, so maybe there were one or two characters who were disabled, and eight classrooms that they surveyed had zero representation of disabled people in any of the material culture that they looked at in those schools. And I think in education in Scotland in particular, because that's the environment I'm familiar with, we focus a lot of attention on children with disability, and disabled children having access to education, having access to learning, and that's really important. And we focused on how they can participate 
in classrooms alongside their peers. Um, so we have this wonderful circle framework, which is uh, written by my colleagues who are literally just down the corridor, focuses on participation and does a wonderful job of that, but doesn't mention anything about the importance of children being able to see themselves in the resources that they're using in the form of mirrors. So they're seeing themselves as disabled children in what they're reading or in the form of windows to so giving them a view on people who are different from themselves. And it's this mirrors and windows approach that we really advocate for in the form of what children are seeing in terms of disability. Next slide, please. So I don't know whether you'll know this story. This is a story about Smiler Becky. Smiler Becky was produced in 1996 by Mattel, um, and she was Barbie's friend. She was produced um, alongside uh, a wheelchair. So she was a wheelchair using uh, Becky. She wasn't Barbie because um, you couldn't be Barbie in a wheelchair. She was Becky in a wheelchair. Um, but as children came to play with Becky, one thing became apparent, and that was the dream house, which is the epitome of every child, six-year-old child's um, toy world. Um, the wheelchair with Becky didn't fit into the house. Um, and that was a bit of a problem. And Mattel could have done one of two things about that. They could have changed something about Becky. They could have made her wheelchair a bit more slim line, perhaps. Um, or they could have changed the house. They could have put in a door that she could actually use. Um, what they actually did was in 1997 discontinue Smiler Becky. And I'd like to talk about those possible changes that they could have made in terms of the medical and social model of disability. So can I have the next slide, please? So <laughs> the medical model is where things started. Um, and it's a view that's been around for years and years and years. It's the view that disability is impairment, is disability is impairment. What is uh, the impairment about the body? Um, that is what disables you. So um, I can't use my right arm very well. Um, I have a very strange gait um, and that's my impairment. Um, but it's also, according to the medical model, my disability. In the 1970s, um, there was a reaction against that. Um, and what resulted from that reaction was something called the social model of disability. And the social model of disability sought to separate the disability from the impairment. So yes, there's something different about the body. There's some impairment in the body. Um, maybe limbs don't work very well. Maybe limbs aren't there at all. Um, but what is disabling is not the body, but the environment that people find themselves in and the attitudes that people encounter. So um, I'm on the third floor at the moment. In order to get to the third floor, um, I use the lift. Um, the lift enables anybody to be able to get to the third floor, and enables and empowers everybody. Um, so that's a separation between the barriers um, in the environment and the attitudinal barriers that people face vis-a-vis -vis whatever is uh, different about the body. In 2018, Anna Waldschmidt threw everything up in the air in terms of how we define disability and started questioning what we mean by ability and what we mean by disability. Um, and that debate and that academic discourse is ongoing. For the moment, though, um, we're, we're going to stick with the social model of disability, remembering that actually that's not the end of the story. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the ways in which we can see the social model of disability is in children's toys. So I did some work with Lego. Um, uh, no, I didn't. I did some work with, with the BBC on a programme that looked at representative toys. And one of the people that we spoke to was Lego. And in 2016, as part of this programme, Lego said that any minifigure in their assortment could be deaf if the child decides to play that it was. So if they could pretend play that the character was deaf, then any of their minifigures could be deaf. In 2020 and again in 2022, they have changed their tune dramatically. So now they are saying that they understand the importance of representation. They want their fans to be able to imagine themselves into the action and they have 
Lego city sets that are representative of the world in which children are living. So now we see um, school buses with ramps, schools with lifts, um, and we minifigures with hearing aids, um, among many other characters that represent disability. And I know the Lego Friends set that came out in January this year um, also incorporates a number of neurodiverse characters in that range. So in terms of representation, books are getting more representative in a positive way, and so are toys. Um, next slide, please. Oh, so why might we care about this in terms of schools, in terms of the social model? Well, it chimes with several different things that we need to be aware of as educators. One is the disability equality duty guidelines um, that say that we need to challenge disabled attitudes and promote positive attitudes. So doing using these kind of toys and using these resources really helps with challenging those attitudes as Sarah has shown. Um, and also chimes with the World Education Forum's vision for education in 2030 um, that sees that education is transformative and that it addresses marginalisation and inequality. So another way in which we can think about policy supporting these findings. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, the other documentation that you might be aware of is the National Framework for Inclusion. And again, this is peculiar to Scotland, um, but could be used um, anywhere in the UK and it invites student teachers and teachers and senior leaders in education to think about what it means to educate all children together. So how can we break down barriers? How can we reduce prejudice? And within there, there are a series of reflective questions around what are the structures? What are the practices that promote or inhibit inequalities? What are the biases that I have? How do I include all learners? And again, these resources are one very concrete way in which we might provide mirrors and windows to break down those barriers. Um, next slide, please. This is the final bit of um, policy based um, uh, that, I'll, that I'll review. Um, so Education Scotland is very soon going to be launching um, uh, professional uh, learning framework about inclusion, well-being and equality. And there's four themes within that around rights and equalities, around building relationships, around inclusion and again around well-being. And these resources, again, um, following that social model thinking, fit into quite nicely into those themes. And we hope give educators the confidence to talk about disability in positive ways um, and in useful ways that challenge those negative experiences and attitudes. Next slide, please. I'm going to hand over to Claire, who's going to take you through the resources. OK, thanks very much, Shan. Um, so my name's Claire Utman and I'm a senior lecturer in psychology working alongside Shan. Um, my um, background and area of research is mostly in um, health psychology, the psychology of disability. And so being able to bring that knowledge into education with Shan has been really um, useful in this project. And I've really enjoyed working on this this way. So I'm going to take you through um, some of the actual resources that we've produced for educators and show you how we've developed them. We are very um, conscious that in order to produce resources that are most useful, we needed to be able to provide an evidence base for them and show how they've worked in terms of working within children's and cha changing children's attitudes. So we've worked over a couple of years on this project. I'm going to take you through the different stages of it. Uh, can I have the next slide, Hannah? Thank you. So the three um, years worth of work that we've done on this project, each year is kind of taken a different um, focus. We started off with her pilot in Yorkshire, then we moved it into Scotland and developed the, the study further. And then most recently has been the final creation of these resources, which we're presenting you today over the last year. So I'm just going to take you through each of the first two um, fairly briefly and then finish up with telling you about the resources that we currently have. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? I feel like Chris Whitty with my next slide, please. I feel like we should have a 
beeper. Um, so in Yorkshire, we worked with um, a not-for-profit company called Toy Like Me, who approached us to just ask us so for a little bit of help evaluating some of their resources that they themselves had developed. Um, and that really got us engaged with thinking about the way that imagined contact could be used within the schools. Um, we luckily have been able to continue to use Toy Like Me um, the resources that Toilet Me have originally produced, but we have we're 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 developing them independently from from Toilet Me, but with their support. Um, so we went along to um, three different schools in Yorkshire, and and we were able to get data from 145 children. And what the children were doing in this study was was essentially just engaging with the exhibition, um, which you can see here some pictures there. It's large poster sized pictures that go up on the walls and then the children look at them, talk to talk about them. There's a series of activities that go along with them, a little quiz that helps them engage. And um, what we were really interested in doing was trying to do a pre and post exhibition assessment to see how their attitudes had changed. Um, so we did that just by getting them to write a little story for us. I'm going to go in a little bit more detail about this in a moment. But essentially, they're writing stories for us about characters. And we looked at how the language that they used and the stories that they wrote reflected changes in their narrative and their attitudes. We certainly found a shift in those stories. Um, less negative, le less medical, more positive, more social model following the exhibition. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, mine's gone a bit crazy. It's gone really big. <laughs> um, so, sorry, mine, my slides have gone really massive. I don't really know why. I'll just have to. Okay, I'll. Hopefully, I can remember what I was supposed to say because all I can see at the moment is my logo. <laughs> um, so, I what we do? Want me to stop sharing and and, and upload no, it again? Fine. Would that be helpful? I'm sure, I'll, I'm sure I'll jump back on in the next one. So, okay. essentially, what we were getting them to do is we showed them a picture of one of the characters and we asked them, do we give them a beginning of a story? Please tell us about a really fun day you would have. So quite similar to um, Soraya asking them to play with the dolls, we were asking them to imagine playing with these characters and having it, spending a day with them. Um, story stem completion is something that's used in social psychology a lot. Um, it's really um, a nice novel way of getting people to explore their attitudes and their perceptions without necessarily asking them specifically to give us their own explicit attitudes because often they might not really know what their attitude is or they might be socially undesirable attitudes or in this case with children the, it, this is an easier way to engage them in talking about things so it's a really exciting and novel way of us um, accessing this information. Next slide please. Okay, it's gone back to the normal size now. <laughs> um, so then we moved up to Scotland with our study. This was all kind of post COVID, but we were allowed to go back into schools at this stage, which was fantastic. So you can see some pictures here of us in one of our local schools. Again, um, we were able to go into five different schools this time and saw almost 300 children. Um, we found that using these resources again had that effect where we were looking at the stories that they were writing, that we could see a real shift in the narrative. But what we also did with this study was some quantitative analysis where we did assessments of attitudes towards disability, very similar to Soraya's, um, and looked at their attitude changes before and after taking part in this exhibition. Um, so again, as well as the change in narrative and discourse, we also found that children were significantly more likely to be able to identify that they knew someone with a disability and also that knowing someone with a disability was more positively associated with positive attitudes towards them. Next slide, please. So just going to show you what some of these resources look like um, on our website. We will we'll, share the website at the end of this, but you'll be able to see all of these images. Um, we have them in those large poster sizes, but within the teacher's resources, we have them electronically. So you can put them up on a board or you can print them out. Um, and the idea is that you have 12 different posters, each of which represents a different disability through toys. Um, now, most of these um, were actually prototypes that were made 
specifically for this exhibition at a time where we didn't really have access to very many um, uh, disabled toys at all. So the some of these are not available to purchase, but now there are actually a lot more that are. So for example, you can now buy Barbie with prosthetic limbs, you can now buy wheelchair users in Lego. You can't yet get a sign language using Barbie, unfortunately, but you can see her represented here. Next slide, please. So alongside these posters and images, we have um, a series of activities and discussions. So this is examples of three of the different pages that you get in the teacher's resource pack. Um, so in the centre here, we have the what we're calling the talking about section, where we provide teachers with some background knowledge about each of the images that are presented guiding them to um, give them some talking points that you might like to discuss with your learners. Um, so things like giving them some language choices. So what do you notice in these images? Guiding them towards particular things that Olaf is wearing a cochlear implant, what that is. Um, also giving you some go further suggestions, things that you might like to look up and show them or buy if you have the resources available. Um, also within the pack we have class challenges and get creative sections. So the class challenges are more discussion based topics and activities. Um, so really getting children to think through how they understand disability within the real world. So things like, for example, um, asking them to consider somebody walking into a cafe, for example, and the whole room is full of um, sign language users and they're all chatting away animatedly. A hearing man walks in and he can't sign. So he can't make conversation in that situation. So in that particular example, who is disabled? And it's this notion of what Shan is talking about, that it's not the impairment that is making the, um, uh, the deaf people disabled, it's actually the lack of being able to communicate. And so transfer that onto the hearing man and it gets them to just think differently about what disability is. Um, and in the great creative um, exercises, these are a lot more hands on, kind of arty, um, you know, lots of examples of things you can do. We give you lots of printouts that you can use already in the pack and some other examples of some exercises and activities you might like to do. For example, um, taking a toy that you already have and adapting it, giving it a toy makeover to make that into a disabled toy. Um, can we have the next slide, please? OK, so here's just some um, lovely pictures of us taking this out onto the road and um, the children writing their stories about it and engaging with it and really getting um, interested. The more we found that actually using things like the quiz really got the children interested and excited and we got to do lots of talking to them and lots of asking them questions. We took along a lot of our toys to show them as well, which was great. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things that we also did within this project was just asking the children to reflect upon what being disabled was and we were interested in just seeing what the difference is before they take part in the exhibition and use the resources and after and again we saw a real shift there and um, there was lots of them um, lots of more medical understandings of disability prior and um, also lots of things about you know people being disadvantaged use of the word handicap which we were quite surprised about we weren't really expecting that word to still be in use but it clearly was and um, lots of things about it being sad and tragic um, following the exhibition we found a lot more of that shift and more positive attitudes and more positive discussion and lots more discussion about things just being different but certainly a level of acceptance there from the children um, next slide, please. And again, just quickly to run through some of the different stories that we were given by the children, which were excellent. Um, uh, he, he, here we have one example, Plushy the dragon. Um, so dragon who falls over after eating lots of honey, falls on his ear, goes to the doctor and now he has a disability. So this whole notion that the, the disability is linked to do the doctor and to being hurt. Um, but the you know, positive side, at least he can't hear the watch that rings every single day. I'm not sure that's necessarily a positive attitude to hold, um, but we can see the, the kind of real medicalization. And in the um, example with um, Ken, um, who has been named Bob in this situation, that he's needed to be helped. There's a real kind of um, uh, uh, needing to take care of the, um, the person who has disability. Can we move on, please? 
post exhibition, the stories shifted and we were getting a lot more stories such as this one with um, this cool little guy um, in his helmet and his wheelchair saying they're going to the swing park. And when we get there, well, there was an amazing swing for wheelchairs, which is great because my friend has one. This understanding that if the environment has been changed, they can still interact with it. And that's something that they've picked up from doing the exhibition. Uh, next slide, please. So um, again, just to quickly show you some of the quantitative findings that we have, which are very similar to Soraya's, this idea that knowing somebody who is disabled leads to um, more positive affect and more positive behavioural responses, and that it's this affect, this um, emotion that leads to that positive behaviour, that causes that positive behaviour. Next slide, please. I'm always quite delighted when I get past that slide. Um, here I just wanted to show you what we mean when we say we've mapped onto the curriculum. We spend quite a lot of time working with our teacher colleagues, um, asking them to look at all of the all of the activities that we have and map them directly onto the different areas of the curriculum. So not just arts based, but actually thinking about English, literacy, math, science, and showing how your experiences and outcomes can be mapped directly onto the activities that we're using, which makes it much easier for teachers to put these into practice in the classroom and their planning. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so if we jump forward to this year, um, we've had a bit of a, um, a busy year, but we've been working with, um, we wanted to try and make these um, resources as, as accessible and as inclusive and also as, as usable for the intended um, uh, the in intended audience as possible. So we recruited um, a series of focus groups made up of educators, uh, disabled adults, parents of disabled children and other stakeholders who work within the area and asked them to come in and talk to us about the resources and help us review them. And then we have now adapted and um, enhanced the resources um, according to what they've told us. Uh, next slide, please. So these are just some of the key findings that we that we had from our focus groups and um, mostly that educators really value short video clips, things that they can watch and take in as much information as possible, rather than it being um, something big and bulky that they have to read. Um, also that we need to really think about um, representation of hidden disabilities within our resources. The, another factor that was raised particularly by disabled adults and parents of disabled children is that we're a lot of the time the focus is on the toys themselves. So finding a doll that represents a particular disability, for example. But actually, we need to think about um, how they're played with and also other aspects of children's resources, other children's material culture. So things like the books and television programmes and stuff like that as well. And, and I think one of the main um, findings that we were able to really try and do something about, which is educator confidence. And again, we found that in all aspects of our focus groups that educator confidence in this area was really was really low. And we need to really try and make sure that this resource is, is as available as possible and, and see what we can do to try and increase um, educators' confidence in talking about and dealing with disability and representation. Next slide, please. So we um, invited along some um, little friends of ours um, and they came along and, and took, took part and used some of our resources. Um, and alongside these, we um, identified the specific areas that um, educators particularly said they were lacking confidence in. Um, so we've created a series of videos to support educators. So things like how to talk about disability from a social rather than a medical model, how to look around your environment and make sure that representation is considered there, and um, some kind of easy suggestions of things that you can do in your environment to make sure that everybody feels seen and that others see them. So we've created this series of four short videos, they're about 10 minutes each and they each cover different aspects of the resources and of representation. And they've also all been filmed with BSL interpretation to make them more accessible. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so um, our resources that we have, I love this picture. <laughs> <laughs> the resources that we've developed are all going to be available on our website. We, I've got a link at the end of this to take you straight to our website. Um, all of our resources are going to be available there for free um, for you to download as you see fit. That includes the full resource pack with all of the images, all of the activities, um, the mapping to the curriculum as well as all of the instructional videos which are just in the very very final stages of editing and post-production but they should be there within the next week or so. Um, we've also we've also shared an auditing questionnaire which we really encourage um, educators to use. Really look around your environment and take a little audit of where do you actually see. Sometimes you don't think about it until you look for it. Can you, is there anywhere that you could change some of your practice? Are there pictures on the walls? Are there books on your shelves? Example, that sort of thing. And we've also created a resource directory, which is a real kind of dynamic live document, which we're hoping that when people use it, they're able to give us feedback about any resources that they find themselves. But we've started a directory of a whole series of resources, again, trying to think about which um, areas of the curriculum they might link to and where you can get them from and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so just to kind of summarise what we're what we're saying here, essentially that throughout all of our work and um, Soraya's, Shan's previous work, our work in the last couple of years, we've really found that um, imagined contact and particularly within these resources is having a change in children's attitudes before and after they take part in this exhibition and using these resources. Um, all of our resources have been mapped to the Curriculum for Excellence, um, second level learners. We're currently working on first level learners um, and also to the key stages curriculum in England and Wales. And we've tried at the moment to make them as accessible um, as possible, but we are continually developing them and we will continue to develop them. We're also aware that in order to try and tackle some of the issue around confidence in educators, we are, we are developing a micro-credential that teachers will be able to do as an online course via QMU um, to, again, help them with their confidence in language and the social model of disability and how this can be incorporated into education. So really just, I think your, our take home point that we would like you to think about is that disability representation is, is actually quite simple. It can be as simple as making sure that when you use a PowerPoint slide, there's a child in that slide who is using a wheelchair or has a crutch or has a hearing aid, even if you're talking about something like maths, you know, just try and make them visible. Um, so it's fairly simple, but it is quite crucial. It's a crucial element of moving towards a more inclusive environment within our schools and wider society. And um, we really feel that starting with children, their toys and their imagination um, is, 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 a really, is a really good place to start. Um, so next slide, please, Anna, and we'll just kind of conclude a little bit. So just want to say thank you to all the people who have helped with this project. We were lucky enough to be given funding from QMU Innovation Fellowship. Also, thank you to Rebecca and Karen from Toy Like Me who have supported us from the beginning and have thankfully allowed us to continue to use all of their resources. Also to our students at the university who have helped with this and um, our fantastic willing participants one of whom may or may not be re related to me, uh, who, who came in and let us film them playing with all of our toys for our videos, um, and to Michael for making our videos. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we have a link for you. You can scan here to take you directly to our website, or you can click on the link there, the Seeing Me, Seeing You website. It is at the moment, the pack is there, which has all of the resources in it for teachers and the mapping, but the videos are still to come. So um, if you keep popping back, you'll see those come in, coming in the next few weeks. And if you follow either Shan or I or the um, toy research group on Twitter, we will post them out as soon as they're available. Um, we're also really keen if anybody would like to talk to us further about piloting any of these resources. We'd love to have a school or a teacher take them on and tell us what they think about them. And um, the more people we can get reflecting on them and, and feeding back to us, the better. So if you are interested in that, I've also just popped a little QR code and form there just to get your details and then we can get in touch with you and we can have a little conversation about it if that's something that you might be willing to do for us. 
Um, I can't remember what's in the next slide, Anna, but you may as well go on to it. <laughs> Uh, no, I think I think that's coming coming to the end now. So it was just okay. really um, I'm aware that we don't have um, time for breakout rooms. So I suppose it's about just asking everybody to go away with the reflective questions, have a bit of think about them, think about what you've learned today. There's so much like really important information. Um, I've learned a lot. So thank you so much. And some real like practical steps as well that makes it seem really uh, possible and attainable to, to make those changes that, that make classrooms a wee bit more inclusive. So thank you so much much for that. And um, just in terms of um, if anyone has any questions from the webinar today, is there a way to get in touch with either of you directly or is the best way through the, the forms link there? So you'll see on the um, on that slide there, we've got a Toy Box Research Group email address. Um, and if you email that, that comes to both Shan and I. So Magic. you're welcome to send it to there um, or send us a message on Twitter if you like um, either of those ways. You can also get if you go onto our website, there's also a way to get in touch with us there directly as well. So you can get in touch with us in a variety of ways. Oh, there Shan's also just popped her email address in the chat too. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. So um, I'll just pop onto the last slide just now, which is just to ask you to, um, if you're happy to and you've got a moment, to complete the, the poll so that we can see if people are feeling a wee bit more confident after the webinar. Um, and then we also have a, an evaluation form and um, just helps us shape our webinars as we move forward. So if you have time to complete that as well, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, otherwise, I'll hang on uh, for a wee bit if anybody has any kind of questions or anything. Um, and the slides will be um, uh, sent out afterwards um, which have all the details on it um, and we do have a, a um, slide with supportive resources at the end as well if anybody's looking for that. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to hang on for a few minutes if anybody does have any questions um, please feel free to, to uh, stay behind and ask. Thank you very, very much to um, to Claire, to Shan and to Soraya for coming along today, for giving us the time, for sharing all that information. It's been really, really helpful, so informative. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Anna. And I think um, hopefully when, once the videos are all ready, you'll get to see, I mean, essentially they are 10 minutes long and it just involves Shan and I talking you through a lot of this and going into a little bit more detail. And, and we really have tried to give quite practical ideas about what you can do within your environment. And what I noticed at the beginning of the session when people are introducing themselves is that there's so many people here from a variety of backgrounds that are not school-based. And I think even if you're not school-based, thinking about your own environment as well and the work that you might be doing um, in, in, in whichever educational environment you have, you can take a lot of what we're seeing in the videos, particularly into those environments as well. Thank you.